the mission of the Museum of Jewish Heritage in Living Memorial to the Holocaust is to educate people of all ages and backgrounds about Jewish heritage and the Holocaust. And today's event, which is year in and year out so generously sponsored by the museum's dear friend and trustee, Jaime Gottesfeld Heller, helps us to accomplish this goal by not only engaging all of you, and many of you, most of you here are educators, but also by the multiplication of that engagement as you pass on the fruits of what you learn today to your students tomorrow. For the past 15 years, we have welcomed educators from around the region to this exciting day of in-depth learning on Holocaust-related topics. For today, as you know, our topic is the pursuit of justice. Now, this important subject will be addressed by two distinguished scholars, Professor Devin Pendis and Eli Rosenbaum. It is particularly a particular honor for me to uh, be present here today because of, of the presence of Eli. Now, Devin Pendis is a great friend and has worked with us at the museum um, on several different programs. But Eli is a close personal friend of mine. He was both a colleague of mine at the Department of Justice for many years. He was a colleague and then my boss there. <laughs> so it's great to welcome you here, Eli and Devin. But before those distinguished gentlemen mount the stairs to the stage, it is my welcome responsibility to welcome our first distinguished guest, and that is our very good friend and a long-standing member of the Museum's Board of Trustees, Fania Gottesfeld Heller. Fania travels around the world and around the city and around the region to speak about her experiences and has dedicated her life to sharing her message of tolerance and hope with audience, <laughs> audiences of young and old, Jews and non-Jews, college and high school students, CEOs of major corporations, and service organizations, and church and synagogue groups. Born into a traditional Jewish family in a small Ukrainian village in 1924, Fania and her family hid from her would-be murderers with the help of two Christian rescuers. Beset by hunger, marked for death by her neighbors, and faced with the constant threat of discovery and execution, she miraculously survived to share her message of memory and hope. After the war, Fania came to the United States. She obtained a BA and an MA in psychology from the New School for Social Research and honorary degrees from Yeshiva University and Bar Ilan University. She also studied art history at Columbia University, philosophy and literature at the New School and Family Therapy at the Ackerman Institute and is among the very best well-read people I know. She has an agreement with the local bookstore that they will send over any book on a topic that is of interest to her. And I can tell you my library is many books lighter as a result of my knowing fun. <laughs> Whenever she comes, she asks if, if what I'm reading and that uh, I invariably lend her a book. In 1998, Fania received the New York State Board of Regents Louis E. Yavner Citizenship Award in recognition of her outstanding contribution to teaching about the Holocaust and other assaults on humanity. Her memoir, Love in a World of Sorrow, a Teenage Girl's Holocaust Memoirs, documents a remarkable story. If you haven't read it, you should. We've created a teacher's guide for this book, which is, will be available to you today, I believe, which offers discussion questions and student activities for each chapter and incorporates the study of artifacts, including photographs of Mrs. Heller's family. Her story has particular resonance with high school students in social studies and English. 
as you will no doubt agree if you have used the book or have had the opportunity to see Fania in action as she interacts with students. In this regard, I would like to draw your attention to a relatively new and very powerful documentary entitled Teenage Witness, The Fania Heller Story, which is narrated by Richard Gere. This moving film documents the life of an extraordinary woman and shows her doing what no other one does better, and that is reaching out and sharing with young people. Fania's book and film are available for purchase in the museum shop at a special discount for all of you today, and you may purchase a copy of the teacher's guide to the book later this <coughs> evening. How survivors like Fania Gottesfeld Heller, who experienced the very worst of humankind, dedicated themselves to becoming examples of the very best, must surely be one of the most inspiring stories of our time. That Fania survived the war and went on to make such a remarkable contribution to the world, including three children, eight grandchildren, and now 14 great-grandchildren, is a testament to the exponential power of survival. It is now, ladies and gentlemen, my pleasure and honor to invite Fania Gottesfeld Heller to offer some words of welcome to all of you today. First, I should thank David for this kind introduction. I don't know if they deserve it, but it's okay. I, I stand here with humility. It's my 15th year now, and I greet all the <coughs> teachers who were here before. We know each other, and I'm greeting all the teachers who are here today, and all our scholars. So I'm not going to take a lot of time. I just want to tell you why this seminar every year is very important for me. Uh, also, first, I want to thank uh, Dr. Radensky, Elizabeth Edelstein, our Director of Education. I want to thank the staff for all the tolerance, for all the good advice they gave us. We had a hard time always to choose the right topic, which would be the right for the teachers also to take back to school. And I want to thank everybody for giving me the opportunity to be here. We are now, I am now one of the oldest, maybe survivors, to, to bear witness to what happened. Uh, statistically, by 2020, there will be not one survivor alive. Of course, we leave our memoirs, but I, when I come into a school, I put a face to the suffering. I was there. Nobody can tell me that things didn't happen. Now, it's very sad that we're going to speak about justice. We cannot bring our loved back. We cannot bring them. What about those children, the one and a half million innocent children? <coughs> the Russian poet Anna Akhmatov has said, I would like to give you their names, but they're not names, they're only numbers. What are we doing with this? Yad Vashem has now a room with a lot of pictures. They call it the biggest uh, cemetery in the world. It breaks your heart. What's going to happen? We are in a panic. What's going to happen? You know, when Hitler used to brag to, her, to, his, to his cronies uh, to find a solution, he used to give a, a, a talk about the Armenian genocide. 1905, the Turks killed one and a half million Armenians. Who talks and who will remember the Jews? And that's for being so afraid. We start to talk about it. You know, when I go to schools, I ask sometimes, what, who knows what's the difference between genocide and a conventional war? Very few know, very few. I spoke yesterday in the Frank Sinatra school, very smart kids, they were supposed to be here today. You know, they asked me, isn't it time to forgive and to forget? They're not old, I said, no. The Bible said there's some crimes which cannot be forgiven. Only God can forgive them. Why should I forget? Why should I forgive if the guy is old? I remember. I saw them. We never went, we never went to a concentration camp. I come from the Ukraine. 
They were killed on the spot. And who, who were the killers? I think I remember I read about Elie Wiesel who said when he came to Eichmann's trial, he hoped to see a monster. Instead, he saw a bureaucrat sitting in a glass booth taking notes. No, they were not monsters. They had PhDs and MDs, and they were jurists who signed the Wannsee <coughs> Conference of Death for us in Eastern Europe. Not the monsters. So this is where I come from. As David said, you know, give you statistics. Why I'm so passionate about teaching what happens when evil takes over. Why am I so passionate about teaching when people are not tolerant to each other. We have to teach our children that we're all the same. That we have to be a brother's keeper. It doesn't matter what religion or what color. I, uh, statistics. I come from a little shtetl, the Yudha Bauer called us Little villages, Shtetl. 5,500 inhabitants, 1,500 Jews, the rest are Ukrainians and Poles. Statistically, of the 1,500 Jews, 45 of us survived. From Hebrew school, the most famous Hebrew Talmud school, only two of us are still alive. And I'm 89, and my friends too. Thank God I have still all my abilities, you know. But I don't have friends anymore. Either they demanded or that. And how can you, they asked me yesterday in school, how can you live with so many scars? Yeah, I do live with scars. I still have scars. I speak about it very often. How can you become normal after you live like an like animal? If you, you're afraid every minute you're gonna die. People said to me, why are you still going around? You're an old lady. I have to teach. First of all, I have to teach the young people I'm not, that you can, can come from ashes and destruction. When I came to this country in 1960, I knew a lot of languages, but not one word of English. I had three kids. I worked with my husband, but I studied at all my degrees, and I can help others also. What else shall I tell you? I greet you all, and I think we're going to have a great time today, and we're going to learn a lot about justice. Do we still? I mean, <coughs> can you even imagine what happened to us, where I come from? We were killed on the spot. They asked me if I have a number. No, we didn't have numbers. And Father de Bois speaks about it. He goes now everywhere to Europe, I have it in my tape and, and to open up all those mass graves. You said they were killed like dogs, and still they should be buried. But with dignity. And that's all that I have to say. I have a lot to say, but don't stop with me. <laughs> <laughs> my son says, don't stop with my mother. Because there's no ending. And we have two great scholars, and I would like to study and listen myself what they say. So all of what I want to say, uh, this museum, uh, on behalf of the museum, on behalf of the board of the educators, and all of the survivors still alive here, we still have something. I want to thank you for coming here. By coming here, you are very important to us because you are going to teach the children. You are the teachers who are going to bring the message to them that evil brings more evil. There's no use to it. Well, I come, yesterday in school they said to me, what do you bring us? I said, hope and love. Well, so they lined themselves for kisses and hugs. But they are unavailable. Anyway, thank you so much. So let's <laughs> Just forgot to say that I was rescued by a Polish man, my mother, my father, my little brother, who was eight years old. He was illiterate. He couldn't even sign his name. He signed four crosses, but he was a good Catholic. He said, here's a religion. He didn't listen to the priests who were always telling them that we killed Jesus. 
He didn't listen to the myths that we needed a lot from a baby, from a Christian baby to bake matzos. He said, he knows that only because we are Jews. He risked his life to save us. In order to save the Jews, to save, in order to scare the population, they would take the, the Christian, hang him on the street with his family, with a big sign, I saved the kite. So only for a few people, only two families that we were saved, but not Jews. Everybody else went to the pits. I'm sorry, I have to tell you this. That they serve us as a role model that people can do anything. That he saved with us. He, the last piece of bread, he was the poorest in the village. When he got typhus, he didn't go to the doctor, because the doctors knew that only the Jews had typhus, that he got the typhus from us. So we were all sick together. I'm sorry, that was just an addendum. Sin was now righteous among the nations, and in Yad Hashem, in, in Jerusalem, we have 25,000 righteous people who saved Jews, and there were some three criteria. No, uh, no uh, money, uh, no sexual advance, something. But three, three, three criteria in order to be able to be honored as a righteous among the nations. <laughs> As uh, David told us, and as you mentioned, uh, through this conference, your words have reached more than 2,000 education professionals who've taught, yep, who've taught a whole generation of students about the Holocaust. So um, through your tireless efforts uh, to educate and your compassion for others, um, Fania, you're an inspiration. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Edelstein. I'm the Director of Education here at the Museum. And uh, before we continue our program, I'd like to add my thanks to Fania to my colleague, Dr. Paul Rodensky, our Manager of Education. <laughs> and to Amanda Lanseter, Manager of Curriculum and Teacher Programs, for keeping us all on track. Thank you. Professor Devin Pendis of Boston College. Professor Pendis's research focuses on war crimes trials after World War II. He's a faculty affiliate and co-chair of the German Study Group at the Center for European Studies at Harvard University. He's the author of the Frankfurt Auschwitz trial, 1963 to 1965, Genocide, History, and the Limits of the Law. The forthcoming Law and Democracy, Transitional Justice in German Courts, 1945 to 1950, and numerous articles and essays dealing with the history of Holocaust trials, genocide, and human rights. Um, please see your program for Professor Pendis's biography, which uh, spells out his accomplishments in greater detail. We're very fortunate to have Professor Pendis speak with us today about the Nuremberg trials, denazification, and the Frankfurt trials. Please help me welcome Professor Devin Pendis. So, um, let me start, first of all, with a word of thanks myself to Fania, uh, to David, to Elizabeth, to Paul, to the Museum of Jewish Heritage for the opportunity to speak here tonight. Uh, it's a great privilege. Um, as David mentioned, I've done a number of events here. Um, I think it's a fantastic institution that's doing wonderful work, particularly in outreach to educators. And um, I really uh, feel very privileged to have the opportunity to share uh, some of my ideas, some of my research tonight. Um, the Second World War was the most violent event in human history. Altogether, at least 60 million people were killed, and some recent estimates say that it may have been as many as 85 million people were killed in the war. Anywhere from 22 to 30 million soldiers were killed, between 20 and 30 million civilians were killed outright. Another 20 million or so died of war-induced uh, famines. Um, included, of course, in this number are the uh, roughly 6 to 6.2 million Jews who were killed by the Nazis in the context of the Holocaust um, as a policy of deliberate, racialized mass murder and genocide. Um, given this scope of violence, 
Um, the question of how to organize the peace after this war was even more fraught and challenging than is usually the case. It's not as if ending a war is ever easy. Look at the aftermath of the First World War. It's obviously very easy to mess up the peace. Um, but the Second World War uh, posed particular challenges because it was a war that was unlike previous wars in the scale uh, and the quality of the violence that it perpetrated against civilian populations uh, and in the ways in which deliberate mass murder of non-combatants became a major uh, component of the war, particularly in Eastern Europe. Um, in this context, it's perhaps not entirely surprising that the victorious allies decided to break with past tradition and pursue a criminal legal strategy alongside more typical diplomatic and institution building strategies for managing the peace after the war. But we ought not underestimate how radical this departure was from past practice. Right? Traditionally, wars ended with amnesty and clemency for any wrongdoing. Um, in those few cases in previous uh, instances of war where there had been criminal trials in the aftermath of the war, there were a few in Germany after World War I, there were a handful in the United States at the end of the Civil War. Um, these trials were very limited in scope uh, and they were often deeply politicized one way or another and uh, very uh, inadequate in their uh, legal basis and in their due protections, uh, protections for the defendants, and they did very little to establish a kind of a long-term uh, legacy for the notion that you can and indeed you should prosecute misconduct in wartime uh, as a crime as opposed to as some kind of political mistake to be resolved with a political uh, response. Now today I'm going to focus on uh, trials against Germans. There were a lot of trials, obviously, in the Pacific Theater as well. I'm not going to talk about those, but on crimes against Germans, right? Uh, because this is where the precedent that per persists today in the International Criminal Court really gets established, and the notion that criminal law, international criminal law, domestic criminal law, is an important response to mass atrocity, to genocide, to mass murder, um, has its first kind of debut, as it were, on the world stage in this European context. The scope of the project of prosecuting Nazi atrocities in the broadest sense, not just the Holocaust in the strict sense of the genocide of the Jews, but Nazi atrocities against other European peoples, against their own citizens, uh, as well, uh, indeed, of, of crimes against property, uh, is massive after the war. Right? People tend to not know the full scope of this. Altogether, more than 95,000 Germans and Austrians were convicted of Nazi crimes after World War II. So that's not counting the trials of various collaborators within domestic courts in, say, Holland or Hungary. Right? Uh, this is just Germans and Austrians. Right? The majority of those cases, a little over 52,000, took place in Eastern Europe. Uh, about just under 3,000 were convicted in West European courts. The four major allied powers together convicted uh, 8,812 Germans or Austrians in occupation courts that were held on German soil. Right? And then the Germans themselves, in the period from 1945, when the very earliest trials in German courts took place, down to the present, have convicted nearly 20,000 people for Nazi crimes. About 6,500 of these trials took place in the courts uh, of the Western occupation zones and then the later Federal Republic of Germany. About 13,000 of those took place in the German courts in the Soviet occupation zone and the courts of the East German uh, Democratic Republic. Um, now, I want to take a snapshot of this vast panoply of trials um, and look at two distinct moments in this history. Right? The Nuremberg trials, of the late 1940s and the Frankfurt Auschwitz trial uh, of the mid 1960s. And despite what it said about the title, I'm actually not going to talk about denazification because um, as it, we don't want to be here all night. Uh, there's, there's a 
lot to talk about just with Nuremberg and the Auschwitz trials. Um, I want to talk about uh, the ways in which these two trials shared something essential in common, but in other respects were fundamentally different. Um, the Nuremberg trial and the Auschwitz trial had in common the notion that individual wrongdoing in the context of mass atrocities is criminal. It can be prosecuted in a court of law using the techniques developed by courts over the centuries for dealing with ordinary crimes, right? So the rules of evidence, the rules of procedure, all of this stuff that criminal lawyers do day in and day out can be used to prosecute individuals for their criminal contribution to mass crimes, right? And that these are crimes that deserve individual punishment. Yes, they may be acts of state. Yes, they are acts that are uh, committed as part of an organized collective, right? <coughs> Usually some kind of military or paramilitary organization. But despite that, the individuals who make the decision to participate in these crimes are deserving of punishment just as if they had killed somebody in the midst of a mugging. Right? That is what the Nuremberg trial and the Auschwitz trial share. That becomes uh, a really important underpinning for the development of international criminal law after the Second World War. It undergirds all of the work of the trials for Yugoslavia, for Rwanda, for the current International Criminal Court. Right? It's very precedent setting. Um, but the trials were also very different in very important ways. The fundamental purpose of the Nuremberg trial was to reconfigure international law and consequently to reconfigure the structure of world order and international relations after the Second World War. The core issue at Nuremberg was one of war and peace. A, re a reorientation of German political culture was seen as something that might come out of this trial, it might be a fringe benefit, but the real issue was to uh, help found a new international order that would promote general peace. Uh, the Frankfurt Auschwitz trial, by contrast, was a domestic trial uh, in a German court in the middle of the 1960s with German judges, German lawyers, German defendants, right? Uh, and the goal there, at least for the people who initiated the trial and the prosecution team, was to try to reorient German political culture. The initiators of the trial were, broadly speaking, critical of the complacency of post-war German culture, of the conservatism of German politics, of the generous policies that the German government, the West German government, had pursued in reintegrating Nazis uh, into society. Um, there had been a wave of amnesties in the late 40s and early 50s. Virtually all Nazi criminals uh, who were convicted in the Allied trials were out of jail by the mid-60s. Most of them were reintegrated into society. Nazi bureaucrats, Nazi police officers, Nazi judges, Nazi doctors were all back in their positions of authority. They had had their pensions reinstated. They had gotten their positions back in the government. Right? Um, a few critical voices in Germany in the 1960s thought this was very, very wrong. And they saw the Auschwitz trial as an opportunity to try to highlight the widespread complicity of German society with the crimes of the Nazi regime, with the Holocaust in particular. And they wanted this trial to serve as a kind of a, a public history lesson about the facts of the Holocaust and about the breadth and depth of German uh, engagement with the mass murder of the Jews. So, Nuremberg is really a trial that's geared towards remaking the international legal order. The Auschwitz trial is a trial that is really uh, geared towards remaking German political culture in the 1960s. Um, I, these extra legal goals, right, so both trials have a legal goal which is to punish wrongdoing. They both also have extra legal goals that are essentially political. Right? Um, and my argument here tonight is going to be that they were much more successful at that legal goal, right, at punishing wrongdoing, than they ultimately were at their more political goals, to reconfigure the world, to reorient German political culture. Um, and let me uh, explain then why I think these trials 
worked very well as trials, but were ultimately not as successful as they wanted to be in terms of politics. So let's start with Nuremberg. First of all, just to be clear, when people talk about the Nuremberg trials, there's often a little bit of uh, confusion. Um, there was first the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg from 21 November 1945 to the 1st of October 1945, uh, which tried 22 of the most prominent, important leaders of the Third Reich who were still alive. Obviously, some of the most important figures were already dead, not least Hitler himself. Right? This was an international tribunal uh, comprised of representatives of the United States, the United Kingdom, France, and Soviet Union. Um, and then after that, there were 12 so-called successor trials, also at Nuremberg, uh, between 9th of December 1946 and the 28th of October 1948. These were a purely American affair. These were American military tribunals. They were not international uh, tribunals. Uh, and these were geared towards kind of functional elites within the Nazi hierarchy. So there was a doctor's trial. There was a judge's trial. There was a trial of diplomats. There were a couple of trials of high high-ranking military officers, uh, um, several trials of economic elites. Um, I'm going to focus on the international trial today because it, I think, marks the clearest uh, attempt to use the idea of justice after the war to promote a new international system. Right? The earliest origins of uh, what becomes the Nuremberg trial uh, can be found in the so-called Moscow Declaration, which was uh, issued by the Big Three, Britain, the United States, uh, and the United Kingdom, on November 1st, 1943. So while the war is still raging, height of the Battle of Stalingrad, um, intelligent observers by this point are already starting to assume that Germany is going to lose. It's a question of when, but they're growing increasingly confident now that the United States is fully engaged in the war that Germany will lose. Um, and they make this statement uh, in part to lay out some basic principles for how to govern the post-war question of war crimes, but also to try, perhaps, to deter further Nazi atrocities. The, the, the Moscow Declaration says, on the one hand, that uh, Nazi war criminals whose crimes take place in a specific location will be extradited after the war to stand trial in the country where they perpetrated their crimes according to the laws of that country. But then it goes on to say that, quote, major criminals whose offenses have no particular geographical location will be punished by a joint decision of the governments of the Allies. Um, and the question of how these major, that's all it says, right? We're going to do something to you after the war. We don't know what, but it's going to be bad. You're not going to like it, right? <laughs> um, but we don't know what it is yet either, right? And the reason they didn't get any more specific than that is there was substantial disagreement among the Allies and within Allied governments about what exactly to do with Nazi criminals. Broadly speaking, there were two schools of thought. Um, one thought, one school of thought said we should take them out in the alley and shoot them. Not an unreasonable response, actually. Right? The other said, no, we should put them on trial. In the United States, where this debate was particularly heated and where the outcome mattered most, right? Um, it was U.S. Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau Jr. Uh, supported for a time by uh, Churchill, Stalin, and FDR, who favored summary execution. Morgenthau promos, proposed the formation of military commissions to prosecute low-ranking Nazi offenders uh, and to formulate a quote-unquote list of arch criminals who were to be captured, identified, and quote, put to death forthwith by firing squads after the war. Um, on the other side of this debate was U.S. Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, who prefer, preferred a more legalistic approach, not surprisingly, since he was an old Wall Street lawyer. Um, according to Stimson, the procedures for dealing with major war criminals, quote, must embody at least the, the rudimentary aspects of the Bill of Rights, because the very punishment of these men in a dignified manner, consistent with the advance of civilization, will have a greater effect upon posterity. Right? So the idea that Stimson puts forward is that trials will resonate far longer and will be far less likely to create Nazi martyrs than summary execution. Now Roosevelt 
tends to side with Morgenthau, although being Roosevelt, he's pretty, you know, uh, cagey about coming out in open support of this. When Roosevelt dies and Truman becomes president, he comes down decisively on uh, the side of Stimson and legalism. He appoints uh, Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson, Chief of Counsel for the Prox Prosecution of Axis Crimes. And the question then becomes one simply of not whether to have trials, but how to have trials, what kind of trials to have, what should the charges be. Um, clearly, German soldiers committed countless war crimes in the traditional sense of that term, right? Murdering and abusing foreign civilians, murdering and abusing uh, prisoners of war. Yet it was equally clear already by 1944-1945, right, that Nazi criminality went far beyond this. As Stimson himself put it in 1944, right, the criminality with which the Nazi leaders and groups are charged does not consist of scattered individual outrages but represents the result of a purposeful and systematic pattern created by them to the end of achieving world domination. All right. So the Americans are confronted with a challenge of how do we prosecute crimes that include war crimes but are not limited to war crimes. And the, the notion in the Stimson quote that the goal of the Nazis was world domination is really crucial here because that's the first indication of what the Americans in particular are going to see as the essence of Nazi criminality. So there are two solutions that the Americans come up with, which they then uh, convince their allies to sign on to, for how to prosecute this criminality that is war crimes but goes beyond war crimes. First, a War Department lawyer named Murray Bernays comes up with the idea of using the law of conspiracy, which had been developed in the U.S. Uh, well, it had a long common law roots, but had uh, made great advances in the U.S. to combat organized crime in the context of uh, prohibition, right, to use the law of conspiracy to prosecute Nazi crimes. In a conspiracy, all co-conspirators are jointly responsible for the actions of the group as a whole, regardless of their specific individual contributions. Right? So the idea is if you convict the Nazis of a, of a, a conspiracy to commit atrocities and uh, world domination, you don't have to prove that each and every person you're indicting did something specific in that conspiracy, but was merely part of the conspiracy. Right? Um, the second key decision that the Americans made was to make the war itself the key target of prosecution, with Nazi atrocities being characterized as outgrowths of the German war effort. Right? Um, to that end, when the uh, Allies come together in London in the summer of 1945 to negotiate the terms with which they're going to create an international court to try Nazis, uh, so-called London Charter, right? They come up with four charges that uh, the Nazis can be indicted on. Crimes against peace, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and conspiracy to commit any of the uh, three others, right? The crucial one from the American point of view was crimes against peace, which was defined as the planning and waging of aggressive war or wars in violation of existing treaties. War crimes were well established already in international law at that point, and they consisted, broadly speaking, of bad things that you did to civilians who were citizens of foreign countries. Right? Um, they also came up with a new category of crimes against humanity which was intended to cover essentially the same list of bad things, murder, deportation, enslavement, done to non-combatants, but including non-combatants of your own uh, country. Right? Traditionally, under international law, war crimes could not be perpetrated against your own citizens. Right? So crimes against humanity was designed to deal with crimes uh, in large part that the Nazis had committed against Germans, right? or that they had committed against stateless persons, and if you remember that many of the Jews, not all, but many of the Jews killed in the context of the Holocaust had been rendered stateless first, crimes against humanity encompassed the majority of the crimes that we would today identify as the Holocaust. Right? But for the Americans in particular, and they ran the prosecution and they dominated the, the debates over the London Charter, crimes against peace were seen as the linchpin of this. As Jackson put it in negotiating with the other allies in London, quote, our view is that this isn't merely a case of showing that these Nazi Hitlerite people failed to be gentlemen in the war. 
It is a matter of their having designed an illegal attack on the international peace and the other atrocities were all preparatory to or done in execution of this. Right? So Jackson says the real crime that the Nazis perpetrated was starting the war, the genocide of the Jews, the mass murder of civilian populations in occupied territories, all of that was um, something that they did as part of this more fundamental crime which was starting the war in the first place. Right? The reason that Jackson and you know, his uh, backers in the State Department and in the Truman administration uh, thought this way is they saw the purpose of the Nuremberg, the, what would become the Nuremberg trials, as part of a broader project that the Americans were engaged in at the end of World War II to create a new international legal regime that would outlaw wars of aggression and that this prohibition would then be enforced by the newly created United Nations whose Security Council, after all, has a specific mandate to preserve international peace and is, technically speaking, the only organization that could theoretically authorize wars that are not in self-defense, right? So this is part and parcel of this multilateral institution-building project that the Americans are engaged in in the 40s, and Nuremberg is really very closely related to the creation, in this respect, of the United Nations. As A.H. Feller, the first general legal counsel for the UN, declared uh, the goal for the post-war world was to make a gradual move, quote, towards world law. The trouble with international law, he said, is not that it isn't law, but that there isn't enough of it. The rules only cover a small part of the relations between states, many of them are vague. If the system is to furnish a secure foundation for the world community, it must be developed until its content approximates that of national legal systems. And Nuremberg was seen as the first step in this project of making world law. Okay. So this is what, again, the Americans in particular uh, want to achieve at Nuremberg. The Europeans are more skeptical. The Soviets, as you might imagine, have very little use for this. Um, the Soviets see this as a show trial along the lines of the Moscow trial. But they're willing to humor the Americans uh, because they see that the public punishment of Nazis is still in their interest. Now, there are two problems, though, with this particular American understanding of what Nuremberg should be, what it can achieve. Uh, the first is that it radically misunderstood what was truly distinctive about Nazi criminality, which was not that they had invaded Poland. Um, unfortunately, that was a relatively common occurrence in European history. Right? Um, the true distinctiveness of Nazi criminality was uh, that they had understood war to operate within racial laws of historical development, and within those racial laws, the way to victory was the extermination of entire peoples, particularly, obviously, the Jews, who the Nazis saw as being the embodiment of the forces of evil in the world. So that far from genocide being kind of an instrument of Nazi global domination, right, global domination, in a way, was an instrument for the Nazis of genocide. Right? For them, genocide was the operative principle of uh, historical development, right? uh, and war was a means to that end, not really the other way around. Now this misunderstanding by the Americans of the true nature of Nazi criminality uh, was reinforced by the ways in which the court verdict, the International Military Tribunal judgment, itself further narrowed the connection between war and atrocities. Uh, the court said that um, it in fact said it does not have jurisdiction over Nazi crimes committed prior to the outbreak of the war in 1939. So Nazi crimes against Jews committed uh, during peacetime against German Jews before the outbreak of the war, the court said we don't have jurisdiction over that because it's not connected to the war. This further undermines this kind of understanding of the, the truly uh, radical nature of the Nazis. Right, which was uh, related to their anti-Semitism and which was related to their racialization of international politics, not just to their aggressive quality. Right? Um, the second way in which this uh, American understanding was ultimately faulty 
uh, the development of international criminal law, particularly the criminalization of aggression, um, as envisioned by Jackson and Feller and uh, Stimson and all of these optimists of the late 1940s, depended ultimately not on the development of uh, legal norms so much as it did the development of international diplomacy. It was not ultimately lawyers, but diplomats and statesmen who would control the development of international law. And diplomacy uh, very quickly turned hostile to the very notion of international criminal law in the late 1940s. The UN did manage to pass a convention on the prevention and punishment of genocide in 1947, but that was the only major uh, development in international criminal law really until the 1990s, right? Um, and as the debates around the Genocide Convention quickly made clear, um, any prospects for turning uh, the Nuremberg trial into a precedent for a general uh, modus vivendi going forward, and above all for the creation of a permanent international criminal court to punish wrongdoings on the international stage, had no support. I mean, the Americans at this point professed to have a certain amount of interest in an international criminal court. The Soviets were having none of it. The British were not in the least bit interested either. Um, I think it's arguable that the Americans were only in favor of it because the Soviets were against it. Uh, the part of the evidence for this is that when we actually do get an international criminal court in the 1990s, it turns out the Americans are not really so in favor of the idea after all. all right. um, each, the problem above all, though, was that if you view aggression as the essential condition for having international criminal law, um, it turns out that it's extremely difficult to legally define aggression. In the context of the Cold War in particular, each side tended to refer to every military action by the other side as an act of aggression. In fact, the end of United Nations work trying to create a permanent international criminal court and to draft an international code of criminal law comes when the Soviets in 1950 introduce uh, to the UN a definition of uh, aggression which was specifically targeted towards the American intervention in the Korean Peninsula that year. And, um, and in the context of the Korean War, the UN first suspends uh, and then terminates all work on the development of a permanent international court and of a permanent international code. This stuff gets resumed later, uh, at, off and on in the 60s, more seriously at the end of the 80s. Again, when you get a permanent international criminal court at the end of the 90s, in 1998, uh, with the Rome Statute, the United States very prominently is not a signatory party to uh, the statute, right? I mean, they signed the statute, Bush unsigns the statute. Uh, Clinton signed it in the first place knowing full well the Senate would never ratify it. Um, and the court to this date uh, is still working towards getting jurisdiction over and a workable definition of aggression. So the Americans said, this is all about outlawing aggression, and that project goes nowhere for the majority of the post-war period, okay? So in this sense, the American goal of using this trial to foster world peace as a political project is relatively unsuccessful, okay? So um, quickly turning to the Auschwitz trial and the Auschwitz trial's goal of reconfiguring uh, the German understanding of uh, Nazi, the Nazi past, and what it means for German political culture. The trial is initiated by a man named Fritz Bauer, who was the Attorney General of the state of Hesse, right? Um, and he has the Eichmann trial, about which we'll hear in a minute, very explicitly in mind, right? Um, in 1960, uh, he, by the way, is the one who informed the Israelis of Eichmann's whereabouts in South America, Bauer was. Uh, he did that in part because he didn't trust the West German courts uh, if they got jurisdiction over Eichmann to do a good job with the trial. Right? Um, he ends up in charge of all Auschwitz-related prosecutions in West Germany. Complicated story. Um, in 1960, he said, in the face of all the ghastly and appalling things that the Eichmann trial has once again revealed to us in the entire world, everyone asks, we Germans ask ourselves, 
how these things were possible after 10,000 years of the human pursuit of civilization and culture. We ask in order to learn and in order to prevent a new disaster. And Bauer starts looking around because he wants to have an Eichmann trial in Germany. Right? Uh, and once he gets jurisdiction over um, Auschwitz crimes, he decides that the goal should be to have um, a large trial with a lot of defendants representing every aspect of Auschwitz, from the camp headquarters, through the leadership of the subcamps, through the medical division that was in charge of both human experimentation and the genocidal selections, through the camps the Gestapo that was in charge of extrajudicial executions and torture, including even inmate capos. Right? The idea for Bauer was uh, that, the, that this trial would allow for a more comprehensive understanding of Auschwitz and thereby of the way in which virtually every major segment of the German state was implicated in the trials, uh, in the crimes of Auschwitz. Right? Now, so there are 22 defendants then in the Auschwitz trial uh, representing all of these elements of the camp. Uh, two drop out for health reasons, three are acquitted, 10 are convicted as accomplices receiving prison sentences between three and 13 years, and seven are convicted as perpetrators and they receive life sentences. Now, again, this goal of using the law to change political culture, right? Not just to punish guilty men of the crimes that they have committed, but to change political culture, in this case runs up against two problems. The first is a legal problem. German criminal law, to convict somebody of murder, you have to prove not only that they killed somebody, but that they did it for very specific reasons. German law says a murderer is, quote, anyone who kills a human being out of bloodlust, in order to satisfy their sexual desire, out of greed or other base motives, maliciously or treacherously, or by means dangerous to the public at large, uh, or in order to enable or conceal another crime. In other words, it's not just intentional killing, right? It's a specific kind of intent, base motives becomes the most relevant one. Um, similarly, the distinction between a perpetrator and an accomplice, which is the difference between a life sentence and a uh, maximum of 15 years in German law depends on whether the person internalizes the criminal motives of the crime or merely assists in a foreign deed, as German law puts it. Right? So you have to basically have your own personal base motives for killing the crime. This is a backdoor way of rehabilitating the defense of higher orders. Saying, I was just following orders under German law will not get you acquitted. Right? You still committed a crime, but it will get you convicted as an accomplice because it will show that you have not internalized the base motives that led to the crime in the first place. The German Supreme Court ruled at the end of the 1950s that there were in fact only three main perpetrators of the Holocaust. Hitler, Himmler, and Heydrich. <coughs> they were busy guys. Everyone else was either a co-perpetrator if they internalized Hitler's criminal motives, or was an accomplice if they did not. Right. Um, in the Auschwitz trial, what this meant is that the question was, as of the, before the court, focused as much on why the individual defendants killed as whether they killed, what they did, or how many they killed. And in particular, what comes out of this is that killing in the context of genocidal murder tends to get treated as an act of an accomplice, whereas more sadistic killing that one does with one's own hands tends to get you convicted as a perpetrator. So for instance, the defendant Wilhelm Bolger was a member of the Camp Gestapo. He was in charge of their interrogation division. And in that capacity, he was the most notorious torturer in all of Auschwitz. He regularly beat and tortured inmates to death. He also participated, uh, according to the court's verdict, on a number of occasions in so-called ramp selections. When Jewish deportees would arrive at Auschwitz, they were selected, the majority would be immediately sent to the gas chambers and killed, uh, a smaller number would be admitted to the camp and slowly worked to death. Boger receives 15 life sentences in the trial for his role in torture. Right? He was convicted for his role in the actual genocidal killing operations at Auschwitz as an accomplice, and he receives five years. 
Right? So for the genocide of the Jews, he gets five years. For torturing political prisoners to death, he gets 15 life sentences. Right? <laughs> this is perfectly in accordance with German law, but, uh, and obviously one can debate whether this is an act of justice or not, but it is certainly an act of law. More fundamentally, though, it has a distorting impact on the political transformations that the Auschwitz trial is supposed to put forth into German societies. Right? Um, the press picks up on this emphasis on sadism, on torture, on the pathological psychology of individual defendants. Um, it focuses on this uh, enormously. The defendants are commonly referred to as beasts, devils, barbarians. Um, only rarely are they referred to as Germans. <laughs> um, and as a consequence, right, people who follow the trial in the press right, tend to get the wrong message. Right? They tend to get the message that Auschwitz was a really bad place in which a few psychopaths went crazy. Not that Auschwitz was an uh, instrument of the German state, used in a cold and brutally rational manner for the deliberate purposes of exterminating people, and indeed, that the true essence of Auschwitz was not torture, but genocide. Right? Um, this, I think, is something that goes missing because of the way German law operates in this trial, right? um, and it shows up repeatedly in the press accounts, and then when you look at the, the polling data, Right? It's not surprising then that, that in 1965, at the end of the Auschwitz trial, right, um, only 40% of Germans are even able to uh, name the city in which the trial takes place right, uh, in a survey. And of those who can name what city it's in, 57% think that there should not be any further prosecutions of Nazi crimes, that it is time to bring this program of prosecuting Nazi criminals to an end, to uh, draw a closing line, Schlussstrichziehen, as they say in German, under the Nazi path. This is the exact opposite of the outcome that Fritz Bauer was hoping for. So in conclusion, let me say that I think that um, when the question is justice after the Holocaust, I think if by justice we understand the idea that you can punish individuals for heinous wrongdoing, then I think it is possible that we have had justice in some small measure for uh, the crimes of the Second World War. But if by justice you understand it in this broader sense of a way of transforming the world, of making global peace a real po a reality, of radically altering the political culture of a post-authoritarian state, I think that that is asking the law to do something that the law has never been designed to do, for which it is usually not well suited, and uh, tends to distract from asking the law to do what it does really well, which is punish wrongdoing. Thank you. Understandings and uh, give us context for understanding uh, the work we do with our students. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Eli Rosenbaum. Mr. Rosenbaum is the longest serving prosecutor and investigator of Nazi criminals and other perpetrators, I'm sorry, and perpetrators of human rights violations, having worked on these cases at the U.S. State Department, Department of Justice for nearly 25 years. He has served as Director of Human Rights Enforcement Strategy and Policy in the Criminal Division's Human Rights and Special Prosecution Section since that unit's creation. Mr. Rosenbaum continues to direct the federal government's investigations and prosecutions of World War II era Nazi criminals, and he also handles law enforcement strategy and policy matters in connection with more recent human rights crimes. Please see your program for Mr. Rosenbaum's biography, which spells out his accomplishments in greater detail. We are very fortunate to have Mr. Rosenbaum speak with us today about the Eichmann trial and the Office of Special Investigations Pursuit of Nazis. Please help me welcome Mr. Eli Rosenbaum.
Thanks very much, Elizabeth, for the, that very generous introduction. Uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, it is uh, great to be back home in the city in which I was born. Uh, I want to especially thank David Marwell for his very kind words. Uh, you all, I'm sure, think of him as, as the man who's whose fabulous vision has created this amazing institution in the form in which it exists now, and I give him that, but uh, for me, uh, he will always be uh, a treasured colleague uh, whose uh, brilliant work at the Department of Justice uh, made it possible for us to bring to justice uh, a considerable number of, of Nazi criminals. David was indefatigable in his work there, as I know he is here. I want to thank Elizabeth Edelstein, uh, Paul Redensky, uh, and especially uh, uh, Fania uh, uh, Gutsman Heller, uh, who uh, inspires millions of people all over the world, not least me. I had the privilege of speaking in her home about a quarter of a century ago, and somehow she looks younger now than she did then, so I don't know about this 89 business. We'll, we'll have to look into that, but uh, just a, a joy to see you again. Uh, it's always a, a privilege to be at this extraordinary museum, and, and today uh, a special privilege to follow uh, Professor Pendis's marvelous uh, presentation. That's a, a tough act to follow. Um, I uh, don't uh, uh, do PowerPoints very often, uh, but when I do, I'm the proverbial kid with a new toy, and I, I go overboard. So I've got a very ambitious, uh, ambitiously large set of slides. Uh, I'll therefore be speaking probably pretty quickly, uh, looking over my shoulder to see what's up there, um, and uh, trying to get through as many of these um, as I can. Uh, I don't ordinarily uh, dedicate presentations, but uh, uh, today, especially uh, because I'm speaking to educators, um, uh, with your kind permission, I'd, I'd like to do that. Uh, this is uh, uh, someone who was a very dear friend, uh, Flora Singer. Uh, Name Mendelovitz. Um, she was a beloved teacher in the area in which I live, uh, in suburban Washington, in, in the Montgomery County School District uh, in Maryland. Uh, and uh, she, uh, in addition to teaching French, which she knew as uh, a Holocaust survivor from Belgium, um, she uh, went all over the country and all over the world. Uh, as does Mrs. Heller, teaching a message of tolerance and love as the antidote uh, to uh, uh, crimes of hatred, uh, as preventions uh, of hatred. Uh, she was uh, hidden, uh, at, along with her sisters Charlotte and Betty, uh, by the man at the center of this picture, uh, Father Bruno Reinders of, of blessed memory, um, uh, a Catholic priest in Belgium, uh, seen here with a number of Jewish boys uh, whom he's uh, hiding at the time. Um, and um, uh, uh, by the way, uh, Flora's sister Charlotte became a teacher too right here in the New York City school, public school system. And she carries on uh, the mission that, that Flora probably began in, in that family. Uh, and she goes all over the state and all over the country teaching that same message of, of tolerance and hatred. Uh, after Flora died in 2009, a campaign was launched in Maryland to name a public school after her. Little did I know um, what a difficult battle that would be. I mean, it seemed only logical to me, as I said when I testified before the um, uh, Montgomery County uh, Board of Education, uh, that a school should be named after a teacher. I mean, who does more important work in this country? Uh, and, 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 who are the, 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 the central figures in, in schools, but teachers. Uh, and we pointed out that uh, there are hardly any schools named after teachers in Maryland, and none in the entire United States named, named after a Holocaust survivor. Well, um, finally it happened last year, and the Flora M. Singer Elementary School stands proudly in the Singers from Maryland. I wasn't consulted about the mascot, but uh, Sea Turtles works, I think. That's okay. Um, and uh, by the way, uh, in the center of the picture is uh, Jack, uh, Jack Singer, uh, uh, Flora's husband, and in the uh, pink purple uh, dress is uh, Charlotte Gilman, uh, New York State, New York City teacher extraordinaire. 
Um, I, I, before I talk about the Eichmann trial and the cases we brought in the United States, there, there's something uh, that, to me anyway, is more important that I, I'd like to address briefly, and that's to encourage you to include in your teaching uh, a unit on Nazi crimes, or general crimes against humanity, and also on efforts to uh, pursue justice after such crimes are committed. Um, while the Holocaust culminated in the ultimate injustice of genocide, it began with more modest injustices, injustices that ironically were inflicted by the very institutions in Germany that were sworn to uphold the rule of law and prevent injustice, namely Germany's uh, police and uh, Germany's judges. It's important for students to understand, I think, uh, that what might appear, at least uh, to some people, to be a comparatively minor injustice can snowball into something far worse if no one intervenes. And let's be frank, our children see injustices perpetrated all the time among their peers, almost always by other students. Bullying, taunting, and ostracism, you all know, uh, are the most common manifestations. Uh, as all of us who've been through elementary and uh, junior high school in this country can attest, tolerance does not come naturally to kids. Uh, now, uh, no one would plausibly suggest that hallway and, and schoolyard misconduct uh, or, or even injustices committed in the country at large by adults would ever lead to anything like a holocaust in this country. However, as experienced educators, you know uh, that such injustices can indeed have calamitous impacts uh, on self-esteem and can even lead to tragedy, uh, as we've seen in some of the terrible school shooting episodes. Uh, so by including in, in your teaching the stories of heroic individuals like the man who, who saved Mrs. Heller, uh, like Father Bruno, uh, who saved Flora Singer and her sisters, um, and Mrs. Meep uh, who for so many months protected Anne Frank and the other Jews hiding in the secret annex in wartime Amsterdam, you can help show your students that it is possible for an individual to stand up for what's right, uh, even in far more dangerous circumstances that, than any of our students will ever encounter in, in their lifetimes. So through your teaching and through your own moral example in the classrooms and, and hallways of, of your own schools, you have the extraordinary opportunity to help empower and, and even motivate your students to stand up not only for their own rights, uh, but also for those of others. And so finally, I want to salute all of you for taking time away from your families uh, to study the emotionally difficult subject of the Holocaust. Uh, and, and the aftermath of the Holocaust and, and for your commitment uh, to teaching this difficult subject. Okay. So, uh, Professor Pendus taught us uh, today uh, about the Nuremberg trials. Here you see the defendants. Uh, one defendant uh, who was uh, clearly missing from that trial uh, was uh, a senior SS uh, official by the name of Adolf Eichmann. Uh, before the first Nuremberg trial took place, uh, Jacob Robinson, uh, an international law scholar with the World Jewish Congress here in New York City, uh, wrote to U.S. Chief Prosecutor Robert Jackson, this is the letter I found it at the U.S. National Archives, uh, wrote to him urging uh, that they find Eichmann. Uh, Robinson noticed that Eichmann's name was not on the list of people that the newspapers were saying were going to be tried at Nuremberg, and so he wrote this letter laying out, um, in summary fashion, Eichmann's crimes, particularly his role in deporting millions of Jews to their deaths. And he urged Jackson to add Eichmann to the list of defendants. Well, but Eichmann couldn't be found. He'd vanished. In fact, many assumed that, like Hitler and, and Himmler, uh, he had died. Uh, his name certainly came up at the Eichmann trial. Uh, in a number of uh, instances, including in the testimony of one of his deputies, uh, Dieter Vislicheni, who uh, recalled uh, one of his uh, last experiences with Eichmann was when uh, Eichmann said that he would uh, jump into his grave laughing 
uh, because he knew that he had helped kill some five million Jews. Uh, well, uh, the trials were held, the, the first Nuremberg trial and the 12 subsequent trials, as Professor Prentice had told us, uh, and then the Allied effort to bring uh, Nazi criminals to an effort uh, uh, soon stopped. Enthusiasm waned quickly for these trials, largely because of the Cold War. Uh, the hot war in Europe uh, against uh, Germany and its uh, Axis uh, uh, collaborators was over. The new war was between East and West, between the United States and its allies and the Soviet Union and its satellites. And I think uh, nothing illustrates this uh, more vividly than this document, which was a formerly classified British cable in which the British government in July of 1948 informed the uh, other Commonwealth uh, countries, Canada, Australia, the others, that uh, uh, His Majesty's government was going to bring these, these trials to an end, and uh, we here in London think you all should do the same, uh, because, and, and only the British can write this way, it is now necessary, I feel like saying necessary, it is now necessary to dispose of the past as soon as possible. And, and the cable explains that this is because of uh, the new realities on the ground in Europe, which is to say the Cold War. So, um, as, as Professor Pendus said, the trials came to an end, Nazis were released uh, left and right, um, and so I think it's fair to say that Nazi criminals were, in a sense, uh, among the key winners of the Cold War. While East and West were focused on each other, uh, the Nazis got away, literally, with murder. Here's a good example. Uh, this is uh, Martin Sandberger. He was uh, the leader of one of the uh, uh, most... Uh, terribly effective uh, mobile killing units, a component of the infamous Einsatzgruppen mobile killing units, uh, and was convicted at the so-called Einsatzgruppen trial uh, at Nuremberg uh, of uh, mass murder, killing many thousands of people, as, as he himself admitted. He was sentenced to die, uh, but he didn't die. Uh, he was, uh, uh, his sentence was uh, commuted to life imprisonment, and then on one, one day in 1958, uh, he was released. He became uh, a lawyer, or perhaps he resumed the practice of law, and uh, as an attorney myself, I find that more than a little embarrassing, uh, and uh, lived uh, quite a nice long life for someone who was supposed to have uh, been executed in the late 1940s. Uh, in fact, uh, he lived until March of 2010. So he died just uh, four years ago, uh, in, in uh, I believe it was Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, lived a very uh, uh, profitable life. Uh, here's uh, what some of these, uh, mo one of these uh, mobile killings look like. You see victims about to be shot by, by many, many uh, shooters. Uh, as um, media and public attention uh, to the crimes of the Nazis faded quickly in the 1950s, one of the few names of missing and possibly fugitive Nazi criminals who, whose name did surface in the media from time to time was, in fact, uh, Eichmann, whom, whom you see here in, in uh, his official SS portrait. And historians uh, researching the subject, there weren't so many of them in the 50s, actually, began to get a fuller picture of Eichmann's role in Nazi genocide. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the Wannsee Conference, which Mrs. Heller mentioned, uh, held a secret conference held on January 20, 1942 at this beautiful villa outside of Berlin. You can visit it now. It's, it's, they have a magnificent museum there. Uh, Eichmann helped organize a conference of senior Nazi officials uh, at which uh, uh, the planning was done for the so-called final solution, the uh, mass murder of all of the Jews uh, in Europe. He even wrote the uh, opening uh, address by his boss, Reinhard Heydrich of the SS. Um, and uh, the agreement uh, reached at, at the Wannsee Conference was dutifully recorded by uh, German authorities in, in this document, the so-called Wannsee Protocol. And I don't think you can read it from out there, but uh, there's uh, on one page at the far right, a country by country list of the Jewish population in, in each uh, country. Uh, and they total it at the bottom, 11 million. So that was the goal. Murder 11 million civilian 
Jewish men, women, children, and infants. They fell uh, far short of the 11 million, but a lot closer than uh, anyone could have imagined. Uh, uh, most importantly, Eichmann coordinated, uh, arranged the deportation of millions of, 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 of Jews uh, and others uh, to uh, Auschwitz uh, and other lethal destinations. Here's an order in which uh, uh, Eichmann uh, arranges for 90,000 Jews uh, to be transported to, to Auschwitz, and he signs it, uh, or, sorry, issued over his name. Uh, here uh, we see uh, uh, Jews arriving in daylight at Auschwitz. Often they arrived at night, and uh, they were, of course, uh, terrorized en route to Auschwitz, and they were about to be terrorized in a far worse fashion. But where was Eichmann? Where was Eichmann? The answer was um, he had uh, obtained uh, travel documents under an assumed name and had managed to uh, flee using this passport to uh, Auschwitz, up to Auschwitz, sorry, to uh, Argentina, uh, where uh, he should, that only should he have fled to Auschwitz, right? Uh, uh, fled to Argentina where his wife Vera and their sons uh, later joined him. Uh, there they uh, uh, found a, a simple home uh, in, in a neighborhood of Buenos Aires, some distance, uh, quite some distance from the city center. Uh, he obtained Argentinian identity documents uh, under the uh, false name of Ricardo Clement, uh, and he found employment in, in various uh, rather mundane businesses in the area. Here he is in Argentina around 1955. Unbeknownst to Eichmann, his days in freedom uh, were numbered, as they say, and within uh, a few years uh, would come to an end. Well, how did that happen? Uh, the man on the left, Lothar Herman, uh, an almost completely blind uh, Jewish man living in, in Argentina, uh, found, <coughs> he was a refugee uh, from Europe, I think Germany, uh, uh, learned that his daughter was dating a man named Klaus Eichmann. And uh, the name, he knew the name Eichmann and he wondered. And before long, he came to the conclusion that Klaus Eichmann was uh, Otto Eichmann's son. But what to do with that information? Well, he uh, decided to uh, send word uh, to Fritz Bauer, the prosecutor uh, general of uh, the, the German state of Hesse, whom Professor Pendus mentioned. Uh, and as he also mentioned, uh, uh, Bauer decided that uh, German justice couldn't be trusted in this case. And so he went to the Israelis and suggested that they do something about it. Uh, it's only become known in, fairly, uh, in the fairly recent uh, past that in reaching out to the Israelis, he had the uh, blessing of the, uh, in effect, the governor of his state of Hesse, uh, Georg August Zinn. Um, and uh, I would say, it, uh, it's, it's safe to say, that uh, Mr. Zinn risked his, his career, perhaps even his life, in giving that authorization, but he did it. Uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, uh, agreed that uh, a mission should be attempted to abduct Eichmann and bring him to Israel, and he assigned the task to the man on the right, Yusser Harel, uh, who was the head of the Israeli External Secret Service, the Mossad. Uh, after some months of covert searching in Argentina, uh, Harel's Mossad team found Eichmann's home, famously located on Garibaldi Street. Uh, they managed to get some surveillance photographs. Uh, they learned Eichmann's daily routine, especially uh, which bus he took to go to work and, and which bus he took coming back and when he came back. And an audacious plan was drawn up to apprehend him and spurred him off to Israel. The uh, task, or one might say the honor, of being the one who would actually jump Eichmann uh, and, and haul him into a car parked near where the bus would let him off uh, 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 fell to Peter Malkin. Uh, who died a few years ago uh, here in New York City, was a friend of uh, David Marvel's and, and mine, uh, just a great, great man. Um, uh, anyway, uh, on the appointed day in 1960, in May, uh, the bus came, the man who appeared to be Eichmann got out, there was a car with several Mossad agents, including Peter Malkin, uh, in it. Uh, Malkin was outside the car, I think, uh, pretending that uh, there was a problem with the car that needed addressing. And as Eichmann walked by, Malkin jumped him. Actually, 
Famously, he said, uh, momentito, senor, and then he jumped him uh, and pulled him into the car. Uh, Eichmann uh, they bit him and, and tried to escape, but finally they subdued him, took him to a safe house in Buenos Aires for, I think, about nine days. Uh, and finally, um, after denying that he was Eichmann, by the way, initially he admitted that he was. Uh, he wasn't significantly questioned there. Uh, he did finally agree. Uh, with some persuasion, I'm sure, uh, to go to Israel to stand trial. Uh, the Mossad team drugged him, dressed him in the uniform of um, a flight attendant of uh, El Al Israel National Airlines, <laughs> brought him to the airport in Buenos Aires. Uh, there's the captain of the flight, uh, there's the, the actual plane, and there's the, the flight route. And uh, the drugged Eichmann was dragged through uh, Buenos Aires Airport as um, uh, uh, the others said to him, oh, drunk again, come on. And they got him onto the plane and flew him to Israel. Uh, finally, uh, when they arrived, shortly after they arrived, and the Prime Minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, was, uh, was informed, uh, he made an announcement in Parliament that actually led to pandemonium breaking out uh, he announced that Eichmann had been found, uh, that he had been apprehended, and that he was now in Israel. Uh, a special unit was created in the Israeli National Police uh, called Bureau 06, I don't know why, uh, to um, handle the uh, investigation of the case. Imagine uh, they're handed basically the biggest murder case in history. Uh, and uh, uh, they have only a matter of months to investigate it. Uh, and this is the team that they assemble. The uh, red arrow at the left points to Avner Less, a, um, a German-speaking Israeli uh, police official who was assigned to become Eichmann's interrogator, his pretrial interrogator. And I commend to your attention the uh, book that presents in English translation some highlights of the transcripts of those German language interrogations. Less did a brilliant job of course, Eichmann denied um, having taken any initiatives. He claimed, as did the defendants at Nuremberg, that he was just following orders, basically the same defense uh, to which he would cling throughout his trial. Uh, the man on, at the arrow on the right uh, is an Israeli a police officer, uh, a post-war uh, immigrant from Poland, a survivor by the name of, um, uh, in, in Hebrew, it would be uh, Mikhail Goldman uh, Gilead, originally Goldman. Um, and um, uh, Mr. Goldman, uh, whom I've had the great privilege of meeting and who still lives in Israel, uh, was given one of the most difficult tasks of anyone in Bureau 06. His task was to develop the evidence about the murder of Jews uh, from Poland and the other eastern countries. And Mr. Goldman had the sad uh, obligation to interview countless survivors uh, and to be, uh, to be there as they related tales um, like the one that Mrs. Heller has of, of almost unbelievable um, horror and, and uh, degradation. Uh, and of course, he had his own uh, uh, horrifying tales. Uh, Eichmann was uh, given a, a defense counsel uh, paid for by the Israeli government. Uh, the trial is really a marvel of, of um, respect for the rights of a defendant. Uh, he chose uh, Nuremberg trial veteran Robert Servatius as his attorney. Trial began on April 11, 1961 in a packed auditorium in Jerusalem uh, before three German-speaking Israeli judges uh, seen here. The trial made history. It was the first trial solely and comprehensively devoted uh, to the Holocaust, that is, to the mass murder of the Jews. Uh, it was also the world's first televised trial. Here in New York City, there was, a, 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 I believe, a half, 15 minute or a half hour update on the trial every single night on, I believe, Channel 7, the ABC affiliate, uh, and Capital Cities, which was a company that later acquired ABC, uh, was in charge of, of, of video recording the trial. It received huge worldwide media coverage uh, in, every, uh, in, in every form, newspaper, magazine, television. It also, <coughs> Uh, revived interest uh, in uh, the Nazi era, and particularly in the Holocaust, uh, an interest that, that, of course, persists to this day. Uh, prosecutors uh, are seen here at this table, uh, in the 
lower left is uh, Gideon Hausner, the chief prosecutor. He was the attorney general of Israel at the time. Uh, I'll only mention two, two other members of the team. Sitting uh, right next to him is uh, Gabriel Bach, a deputy chief prosecutor, the only surviving prosecutor of, of the group, and he lives uh, in Jerusalem, later became a Supreme Court justice in, that, in, in Israel. And at the very top is Jacob Robinson, the same man who had uh, uh, written to uh, Justice Jackson in 1945, urging him to add Eichmann to the uh, list of defendants at Nuremberg. Now he was a legal advisor to the Eichmann prosecution team. And he wrote a very important book uh, after the trial called And the Crooked Shall Be Made Straight. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the controversy uh, that erupted um, in, in the wake of the publication of Hannah Arendt's uh, articles in The New Yorker and then her book uh, on the subject of the Eichmann trial. Uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Robinson's book is, is basically a, almost a line-by-line -line response to, to, to Ms. Arendt's book. Eichmann was placed in a protective glass booth in the courtroom. You see him there at the left uh, facing uh, his judges. Um, Attorney General Hausner's opening statement to the court is considered to be one of the greatest courtroom orations uh, in, in, in world history. And I'd like to read the, the very beginning of it. I don't do it as well uh, or as dramatically as he did, but I think it speaks for itself. He said, when I stand before you, judges of Israel, to lead the prosecution of Adolf Eichmann, I do not stand alone. With me here are six million accusers, but they cannot rise to their feet and point their finger at the man in the dock with the cry, Jacuz, on their lips, for they are now only ashes. Ashes piled high on the hills of Auschwitz and the fields of Treblinka and strewn in the forests of Poland, their graves are scattered throughout Europe. Their blood cries out, but their voice is stilled. Therefore, will I be their spokesman. In their name, I will unfold this terrible indictment. So the trial uh, was commenced. Here we see Eichmann again in his glass booth, and standing in the foreground is his attorney, Robert Savetius. Uh, Eichmann testified in his own defense. As I said, uh, his defense was he just followed orders, took no initiatives. He did what anyone in the military uh, does, just followed orders. He was cross-examined tenaciously and often brilliantly by Gideon Hausner, as can be seen here. Eichmann clearly not happy with the, uh, the way the questioning is going. The evidence consisted primarily of uh, a wealth of documents, uh, including uh, many that were provided uh, uh, with the assistance of the United States. Uh, we very actively assisted the Israelis. Two governments, by the way, refused to assist, probably among others, those two being the Soviet Union, not a big surprise, and England, a little bit of a surprise. Uh, the other uh, a major source of evidence, and this is really, I think, the heart of the trial, or at least how the trial is remembered, is witness testimony. There were some 112 witnesses, most of them survivors. Uh, they were the heroes of this prosecution and most prosecutions of Nazi criminals, people who were willing to reopen psychic wounds that can never heal, uh, and they uh, uh, subjected themselves uh, willingly to uh, cross-examination, sometimes very unpleasant cross-examination, in order to inform the courts and the world uh, of, of, of what happened. Uh, it took a toll on witnesses, uh, famously, uh, uh, in particular, this witness, Yechiel Dinur, uh, an Auschwitz survivor who fainted as he was uh, recalling uh, what he had experienced uh, at, at the camp. It took a toll on courtroom witnesses also. Uh, here's a witness who's passed out and is uh, carried out on a stretcher. One of the most dramatic moments uh, in the trial um, took place during the testimony of a Polish survivor named Dr. Josef Buzminski, a survivor of, I'm, I'm going to probably mess up the pronunciation and Mrs. Heller will be mad at me, uh, Przemysl Poland, um, P-R-Z-E-M-Y-S-L, so you see why I can't pronounce it. Um, and he testified uh, about um, uh, an atrocity he saw in town, among others, 
uh, perpetrated by a, a notorious SS officer by the name of Josef Schwamberger, who uh, arranged for the administration of 80 lashes to a young boy uh, in the Jewish ghetto there. Uh, it was generally thought that no one could survive even 50 lashes, but somehow this boy survived the 80 and managed um, to stagger away. But Wisminski uh, was sure that there was no way that this boy really could have survived much longer and so was convinced that, that he had died. Uh, but just before he entered the courthouse that day, he met that young boy, obviously no longer a young boy, and was thrilled to learn that he was alive. Well, when, Ms. when Dr. Bozminski offered his testimony about this uh, horrific incident involving the young boy, uh, Prosecutor Hausner said to him, uh, do you see here in this court that same lad who received the 80 lashes? And the answer was yes. And with Hausner's prompting, Dr. Brzezminski explained that the young boy was this man, Michael Goldman, Mikhail Gilead, uh, Goldman Gilead, the police officer I mentioned before. Here he is sitting at that moment at council table in his Israeli police uniform, and you can see on his arm his Auschwitz number. Uh, Eichmann took a very active role in his own defense, as you can see here, where he purports to explain something or other to the court. Uh, his protestations of only following orders were countered by powerful evidence, especially documentary evidence, uh, like this uh, a captured secret Nazi cable from July 25, 1944. I don't have time to go into the details, but what it stands for is, is that Eichmann was plotting to undermine an order of Adolf Hitler himself. That's how dedicated he was to ridding the world of Jews. Uh, Hitler had made a deal to allow uh, more than 8,000 Jewish families in Hungary to uh, survive, at least perhaps temporarily, uh, in order to uh, get the, uh, uh, the Hungarian ruler Horthy to uh, uh, agree that the rest of the Jews would be deported as they were. Uh, but Eichmann uh, took the position that what we'll do is we'll expedite the deportations of Jews so there won't be any 8,000 Jewish families left to save. Pretty bold. Well, not surprisingly, Eichmann was convicted uh, on December 12, 1961. Uh, three days later, he was sentenced to death. Uh, his appeal was denied by the Israeli Supreme Court on May 29, 1961. His Petition for clemency was subsequently denied by the President of Israel, and on the 31st of May, 1962, uh, he was hanged. I should add, uh, I believe this is on appeal, and not at the trial itself, but it may have been the trial. This is a video capture from that uh, Capital Cities video. Uh, Eichmann took his defense to its uh, outrageous extreme, arguing that he said, I am such a victim, and that should not be forgotten. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that didn't play well with the uh, Israeli court. Uh, as I said, on uh, May 31, 1962, he was executed, uh, his body was cremated, I suppose there's a certain poetic justice in that, and his ashes were taken aboard a very small boat out into the Mediterranean off Tel Aviv uh, and scattered into the water so that there would never be any location at which uh, neo-Nazis might gather uh, uh, in his honor, a shrine to uh, his memory in some sense. And uh, there were just, I think, three or four people on the boat, one of whom was uh, that same police officer, Michael Goldman. Well, the Eichmann trial uh, inspired people uh, all over the world, even in, uh, one might say, uh, unlikely places. It, it seemed to have uh, touched, uh, in some fashion, uh, even the cold hearts in the Kremlin. And suddenly Moscow realized, gee, people might actually be interested in the crimes of the Nazis, many of which were perpetrated, of course, uh, in the Soviet Union or in the Baltic countries that were occupied by the Soviet Union. And so the Soviets decided that they would, uh, uh, both, I think, for meritorious reasons and also for propaganda reasons, start exposing Nazi criminals in the West. And one of the first to be exposed was uh, this man, Carl Linnis of Suffolk County, Long Island, uh, and here we see how the Long Island newspaper Newsday reported it on May 23, 1961. Notice it's covered over, uh, uh, it's reported over continuing Associated Press coverage of the uh, ongoing Eichmann trial. Soviets didn't waste a lot of time. Linus was exposed as the former uh, chief of the 
a Nazi concentration camp at Tartu, Estonia. Uh, he was interviewed by, by Newsday. This was uh, an interview, and also by the New York Times. Those were the only occasions on which he ever spoke. He uh, took a sort of a vow of silence after that. Um, and he admitted that, that he was at the camp. He said he was just the chief of the guards. And his defense to Newsday was, uh, I didn't decide who lived and who died. Some defense. But uh, despite Linus's admissions to Newsday, uh, the, my agency, don't blame me, I was uh, eight years old, uh, 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 did nothing. Uh, in effect, uh, they dismissed uh, these allegations as Soviet propaganda. You'll, you'll notice how Newsday reported it. Remember that, Bingo? A few of us are old enough. Reds, not Soviets, the Reds. We were coming right off of the, uh, you know, the McCarthy era. The Reds accused, accused this man. Uh, so the department took no action. I should add, uh, our government has limited jurisdiction in the Nazi cases anyway, because the crimes took place outside the United, United States years before uh, Congress gave us extraterritorial jurisdiction in terrorism cases and some other cases. Uh, all we can do is uh, bring suit in federal court, uh, prove what they did, and get their ill-gotten US citizenships revoked. Then we have to bring a separate legal proceeding in U.S. Immigration Court to win a, a deportation order. Today we would say a removal order. The goal is to deport them to countries like Germany uh, and Austria uh, that have the criminal jurisdiction that we lack so that they can finally be brought to justice. But the uh, U.S. government's dismissal, so to speak, of these allegations uh, was kind of a, of a piece with how an earlier case of a Nazi criminal in America had been handled, that of this man. Andrea Artukovich, the only cabinet-level Nazi criminal uh, ever known to have entered the United States during World War II. He was the uh, Minister of Justice, so-called, and the Minister of Interior of the Nazi puppet state of Croatia. He signed decrees setting up a nationwide concentration camp system, expropriating the property of uh, all Jews in Croatia, requiring them to wear uh, an identifying mark on their clothing, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, the Yugoslav government, uh, uh, after he was exposed in the early 50s, tried to obtain his extradition to stand trial in Yugoslavia. A federal magistrate in Los Angeles, California, denied that request. Uh, the, the judge said that uh, I, don't, uh, I don't necessarily trust any of these witness affidavits because witnesses are prone to sign things that lawyers put in front of them without meaning, knowing what the, what, what's even in them. Uh, my friends, to this day, extradition is ordinarily accomplished on the basis of witness affidavits. And as to the decrees, uh, the judge said that, um, uh, well, um, how are we going to find people to serve in public office if we hold them responsible for that which they sign? <laughs> Never understood that one, and I, I certainly imagine Justice Jackson uh, and his colleagues at Nuremberg, who've won uh, so many convictions, uh, on the basis of documents that Nazis signed uh, turning over in his grave. The seeds of, of change in, in U.S. Uh, I should add, by the way, that many years later, when my office at the Justice Department was created, which happened in 1979, Artukovic was still alive, and we did get him, decades later, extradited to Yugoslavia, uh, where he was convicted and sentenced to uh, The seeds of change uh, began uh, uh, to be planted in uh, 1964, July of 1964, uh, when this woman, uh, then Queen's housewife Hermina Ryan, originally Hermina Braunsteiner Ryan, a vicious guard at the uh, Majdanek and Ravensbrück concentration camps, was exposed in the pages of the New York Times by then New York Times reporter, later senior editor, uh, Joseph Lelyveld. Um, and um, uh, eventually uh, she was, after a period of quite some years, extradited to Germany in 1973, and years after that, uh, convicted there, and uh, she received what, as I, I think you gathered from Professor Pendis's presentation, is a very unusual sentence of life imprisonment, nearly all of which she served. Uh, later, uh, in the 1970s, uh, a landmark series of exposés of alleged Nazi criminals in America uh, was published by the New York Times, uh, and those were authored uh, by one man, uh, Ralph Blumenthal, and I am so pleased to say that uh, Ralph is, is here today, He's somewhere in the back. He's up in the front. Ralph, could you stand for a second? This was truly courageous reporting. Um, I mean, 
the very best uh, uh, investigative reporting that uh, anyone could ever hope to, to author or any of us could ever hope to read. <laughs> and it came to the attention of uh, people in Congress, especially one woman, Elizabeth Holtzman, who represented uh, Brooklyn, New York, uh, and hearings were held. I mean, this is, of course, the way it always happens in Washington, isn't it? The media exposes a scandal, Congress notices, hold hearings, help, holds hearings, and finally, uh, the executive branch does something. Well, the hearings were held in the mid-70s. They, they shocked the country um, even further. Uh, and finally, uh, the Office of Special Investigations was created. Uh, well, I should say also a, a, bill, a, a, a law was passed named after Liz Holtzman uh, that for the first time expressly rendered Nazi criminals uh, deportable from the United States and barred their entry into this country. It shouldn't have taken until 1978 to get such a law, but that's, that's the way it happened. But none of this would have happened, I'm sure, without Ralph Blumenthal's fabulous reporting. Uh, so our office was created, and, and here's our original building, which David will remember, the corner of 13th Street uh, and, uh, and, and K Street, northwest above the fried chicken restaurant. I can still smell it. Um, and the challenges in this work were enormous. I'll try to race to a conclusion here, uh, just go through a few more cases. Uh, I mean, these were crimes that had by then taken place decades earlier on the other side of a vast ocean. The evidentiary trail had long since grown cold. The uh, witnesses uh, uh, who might have been inclined to cooperate with uh, a government investigation had mostly been killed in the perpetration of the crimes. Many of them had died in the years after. For the most part, the victims who survived did not know the names of their tormentors. Uh, so our work was cut out for us also. <laughs> uh, the Germans had destroyed vast quantities of incriminating documentation in the closing months of the war when they realized that the war was lost. And although uh, uh, millions of pages of documents had, had survived, they were and remained scattered in archives all over the world. Uh, the largest number of them probably in the Soviet Union where they were mostly inaccessible to Western prosecutors, investigators, and historians. One of our first cases was against this man, uh, Fedor Fedorenko, who admitted that he was a guard at the Treblinka death camp where hundreds of thousands of Jews were murdered. Uh, he was found living in Florida, ironically, in Miami Beach, Florida. Uh, uh, his case uh, uh, eventually uh, went up to the Supreme Court and he lost his U.S. citizenship, was eventually deported to the Soviet Union where he was tried, convicted, and executed. At the Supreme Court, the case was argued uh, by the Attorney General who, in the Carter administration, had created our office. Uh, none other than Benjamin Civiletti, uh, the Attorney General, did a great job. I, I would say that even if he wasn't the boss, he really did do a great job. The Supreme Court uh, ruled in, in the government's favor and gave us a hugely important legal precedent um, for revoking citizenship procured by fraud, and we rely on that precedent to this day. Another one of our early cases, um, David knows all of this so well, uh, Adolf Albrecht, Albrecht von Bolschwein. Uh, he was an advisor to Adolf Eichmann and played a role in um, uh, proposing uh, the uh, nationwide pogrom, uh, which we know today as Kristallnacht in 1938. Uh, unfortunately, after the war, I can say now, he became an asset of the Central Intelligence Agency uh, and was allowed to move to the United States. Uh, we found him uh, in the uh, Sacramento, California area. We succeeded in getting his citizenship revoked, and uh, he died shortly thereafter before we could remove him. A New York uh, area case, uh, Jacob Reimer of Carmel, New York, Putnam County. Uh, most of us folks from Long Island tend to think of anything north of the Bronx as upstate, and well, so I don't know exactly where it is, but it's upstate, uh, not too far. Uh, uh, Mr. Reimer uh, was a non-commissioned SS officer at the Trevniki SS base and training camp in Nazi-occupied Poland. It was, frankly, a school for mass murder. It's where they trained men to be guards of death camps, slave labor camps, take part in killing actions and ghetto liquidations. And they had a, a Jewish slave labor camp right next to the training camp so that they could practice on live Jews. Eventually, uh, in 1943, they closed down that, that, that camp and shot to death all 6,000 plus prisoners. Uh, Mr. Reimer uh, took part in uh, a number of crimes, including the, uh, one of the most notorious of the Holocaust, the destruction of Warsaw's Jewish ghetto. I got to question him 
uh, on May 1, 1992, uh, at the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Manhattan. And it was uh, over a period of hours, very much uh, the classic kind of peeling away the onion. Well, he admitted he was a Trevnicki, but he didn't do anything, didn't harm a soul, didn't see anybody die. Uh, but finally, <coughs> I suppose because he thought I knew and wanted to admit something, but not too much. He admitted that he led his own platoon on a mission to liquidate a Jewish labor camp, uh, and the Jews were shot to death at a pit in the, in the woods. Uh, he uh, insisted, though, uh, that, well, you know, I, I actually didn't take part in that because I overslept. <laughs> and then, uh, we, you know, explain that that doesn't really happen. Come on, men don't go out with their boss sleeping, a uh, military commander sleeping. Oh, well, and I, I wasn't just oversleeping. I, I fell on the way and hit my head on a log, and, and uh, uh, I was knocked unconscious, and by the time I got there, it was over. So I said, well, but it wasn't really over, was it? Of course, I don't know what happened. It wasn't really over, was it? Well, okay, well, you know, everybody was, but there was one person uh, standing in the sea of bodies, um, but he was pointing at his head. Um, and, and then uh, this exchange happened. I said, there's something about the man who pointed to his head that you haven't told me. Answer, yes. You finished him off? Answer, I'm afraid so. Uh, we brought a uh, suit to revoke his citizenship here in uh, federal district court in, in Manhattan. Uh, we won the case, but the judge took about three years to decide it. Don't ask me why. Uh, and uh, we couldn't make up for that lost time. And so uh, Reimer died here before we could deport him. Another Travnicki graduate, this man, Yaakov Pali, uh, who lives today in this great city. Uh, we got him denaturalized, and in 2004, we won a deportation order. Um, uh, uh, but uh, he's still here in 2014 because none of the European countries to which he was ordered deported, Germany, Poland, Ukraine, uh, will take him back. This is a perennial problem in our cases. Uh, we are constantly arguing that uh, this country whose families sacrificed 200,000 of their sons and some daughters as well to bring an end to the nightmare of Nazi inhumanity should not be the country in which these people live, much less uh, in which they die. Uh, but that argument tends to fall on deaf ears in Europe. Uh, coincidentally, uh, just in the last week or two, uh, a New York assemblyman, Dove Hyken, uh, commenced this advertising campaign I think soon to be extended to uh, some of the MTA bus shelters, not far from where Mr. Pally lives, uh, urging people to, uh, to, to write, uh, 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 to sign a petition uh, to, to try to get Pally removed from the United States. How do these um, Nazi criminals react when, uh, when, when we expose them and bring suit? Well, in, in various ways, ordinarily they hire lawyers, they go to court, try to delay these things as long as possible. Uh, sometimes it plays out a little bit differently. As, as uh, was uh, so in, uh, in this case, this is a former Sachsenhausen concentration camp SS man, um, Michael Kohlenhofer, uh, whom we found in Kansas City, Kansas, across the river, I guess, from Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, and on December 31, 1996, we filed suit in federal district court to revoke his citizenship. The media, of course, uh, went to his house. They never had a case like this in, in, in the Kansas City area and wanted to interview him. Uh, Mr. Kohlenhofer did not want to be interviewed, as uh, soon became apparent to the press when he came out in front of his house. That's an actual Associated Press photograph. Uh, unfortunately, a gun battle ensued with the uh, local police, in which uh, I'm happy to say no, 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 no innocent people were hurt, but uh, Mr. Kohlenhofer was shot in the leg. Uh, and he died shortly thereafter. Uh, a couple more, a couple more quick cases. I, I like to say uh, that that goes down in history as the final battle between Nazi and Allied forces. And once again, the Allies won. Um, there's a case that David Marvel and I worked on together. This is Arthur Rudolph. Uh, during World War II, he was the operations director of an underground V-2 missile production facility that was part of the Nordhausen concentration camp in central Germany. Uh, prisoners were worked under grotesquely inhumane conditions. They perished in large numbers to build uh, the first real weapon of, of mass destruction, the V-2. Uh, after the war, he was uh, brought to the United States under a briefly secret program called Project Paperclip, uh, designed to exploit the uh, 
palates uh, of the uh, top German and Austrian scientists and engineers, Werner von Braun, uh, uh, most notably, he was uh, Rudolf's mentor, so to speak. Uh, uh, the reason I have the arrows on the card is rather than give uh, Rudolf, uh, 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 in this case, he was originally used by the British and the Americans together, so rather than give him a kind of allied uh, identity document, they just took his Nazi ID card, you see the swastika at the top left, and the, the rectangular uh, uh, box is, is a British military stamp. So they just took his Nazi stamp, uh, Nazi ID, and made it a, a, an Allied ID. It's a picture that's probably worth a million words. Um, uh, after um, President Kennedy in 1960 uh, announced that we would uh, attempt to land someone on the moon uh, within the decade, uh, von Braun, Rudolph, and uh, most of the other so-called German rocket scientists transferred to the National. Uh, 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 Aeronautics and Space Administration from the Defense Department, and Rudolf was put in charge, there he is, put in charge of building this, the Saturn V rocket. So it is a sad part of our history that the rocket that took humankind to the moon in 1969 was, was built by a, a, a Nazi slave master. Uh, we uh, managed to get uh, Rudolf to agree to give up his uh, citizenship and return to Germany. Uh, where he was investigated but never prosecuted, and he died in freedom there, I believe, in 2000. Uh, a couple more quick cases. Elfrida Rinkle, uh, whom we found in San Francisco some years ago. She was uh, an SS guard and attack dog handler at the Robinsbrook concentration camp. We deported her to Germany in 2006. Uh, today she lives uh, freely there, so far as I know. An interesting side note on this case, when um, I and a colleague uh, dropped in to interview her at her home. Uh, as soon as she found out what it was about, she ran into another room to bring a photograph to show us, and it was a photograph of her husband's tombstone. And it was one of those big tombstones with his information on one side and space on the other side for hers to be added after she passed away. And at the very top, a very large uh, Jewish uh, Star of David. Uh, she had married a, an escapee from Nazi Germany by way of Shanghai, and I asked her if she ever told her husband about her past, and I thought, it's pretty unlikely, and I'm also thinking, you know, when do you, exactly when do you break that news? It's certainly not um, honeymoon information, that's a definite romance killer. Uh, uh, she said that she had told him and he didn't care, but she later uh, told the media that, um, no, actually she kept that a secret. That, that makes a lot more sense to me. Um, our most famous case, that of John Demyanyuk, uh, former SS guard at the Sobibor death camp. A lot of you uh, will remember. Uh, and that's that's uh, the famous uh, identification card uh, that shows his posting to Sobibor, the lower blue arrow. Uh, some of you will remember this scene when Demyanyuk was pretending to be on death's doorstep as our great colleagues at Immigration and Customs Enforcement tried to carry out the deportation order that uh, we had won. Uh, and, uh, 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 for a while, he was able to fool people into thinking he was near death. But finally, uh, on May 11, 2009, this, this plane took off and whisked him to Germany, where he was uh, charged with uh, uh, many, many counts of uh, serving as an accessory to murder. Uh, the German uh, authorities with whom we work closely largely put on our, our evidence that we had assembled uh, with some enhancements. And uh, here he is arriving in court in, in uh, 2010, though mostly he he uh, spent the, uh, the trial uh, pretending to be very ill and, and with his eyes closed. Some of you will remember that. Uh, but he was eventually uh, convicted of uh, more than 28,000 counts of accessory to murder. Uh, he was thereupon released pending appeal. It's a different system. I dare say uh, that would not happen in the United States. Um, but uh, he died uh, uh, not long thereafter. Uh, we are also have been responsible for keeping Nazi criminals out of the United States. Uh, the most famous such case is that of uh, the former United Nations Secretary General Kurt Waldheim, uh, a matter on which I'm actually recused because I, I worked on this uh, in another capacity during a period of years when I was outside the Department of Justice. But those of you who are interested in the Waldheim case can read the uh, Justice Department investigative report at, at our website. Uh, I will say that modestly on behalf of my colleagues that uh, the Department's efforts uh, are the most successful in the entire world. Uh, we are the only country on earth that uh, for each of the 13 or 14 years that the Simon Wiesenthal Center, named after the, the late Nazi hunter from Vienna, uh, in all of the years that they uh, issue their annual 
ratings of worldwide law enforcement efforts in the Nazi cases, and they use the academic scale to which all of you teachers, uh, with which all of you teachers are, are too well familiar, A to F. The only country that uh, has received the A rating every single time uh, is the United States, and only... Only one other country has uh, received it, and I think that's twice, and that's Germany. Um, to close, I just want to say that our mission was expanded, and later my office, the Office of Special Investigations, was merged with another Department of Justice component to form our current office, the Human Rights and Special Prosecution Section. And I want to just give you a flavor of some of the kinds of cases that we do in addition to the World War II cases. Uh, this, oops, this is a merger. No, uh, this is uh, former U.S. Army uh, Private Stephen Dale Green. Uh, he was uh, prosecuted uh, by one of our predecessor offices uh, in, uh, uh, for the murder of uh, this little girl, Abir Qasim al Yanabi, in Iraq uh, on March 12, 2006. Uh, he and his comrades raped this little girl, and then um, uh, she was older, by the way. Then this is the only picture we have, but she was still a, a, a young girl. Uh, and then uh, uh, murdered the entire family and burned down the house to cover the crime. Uh, Mr. Green is serving a life sentence. Uh, another example of what we do comes out of uh, a massacre uh, that occurred in Guatemala in uh, 1982 at the village of Dos Eres, where uh, uh, virtually everyone who was there in the village was uh, murdered. Uh, after first, the women and girls were raped, then everyone was murdered down to babies who uh, in some instances were thrown alive into a deep, dry well. Uh, the village was, in effect, wiped off the face of the earth. Uh, one of the perpetrators was this man, uh, Gilberto Hordan, uh, found in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. My office co-prosecuted this case with the U.S. Attorney's Office down there, uh, got a conviction, and uh, Mr. Hordan is uh, serving uh, the maximum sentence for uh, naturalization fraud. Um, with that, I'm going to skip to my very last slide, so forgive me, um, something that I want to bring to everyone's attention. Um, we uh, are very aggressively uh, pursuing uh, perpetrators of human rights violations, and we have a tip line, and it's up there. It's 1-800-813-5863, and we also have an email address to which tips can be, can be sent. Um, you can go to our website and do it that way. Uh, uh, but we really uh, need the public to come forward with, with this kind of information, and I promise that it will be uh, pursued aggressively. My last thing is to say that uh, we have a newsletter as well, talking about law enforcement actions uh, by the Justice Department in the human rights cases, and if anyone is interested in being added to this electronic newsletter distribution list, somewhere there is a pad on which you, is it somewhere? Uh, we'll, we'll make it available, in which if you just put your email address, we'll, we'll add you to it. Thank you so much for uh, putting up with